Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy video podcast. This is Joe Chaffin speaking. Today, we're going to do part four of the basic immunohematology series. Um, if you've been with us for a while, you'll know that part one was the blood groups overview. Part two, pretransfusion testing. Last month in March 2012, we did a kind of general theoretic theoretical overview of antibody identification. Today, in April 2012, we're going to do rubber meets the road stuff. We're going to do basic examples. We'll have, we'll have six cases that we'll go over today. Uh, we, we will specifically be going start to finish on each of those cases and looking at exactly how uh, to, to handle basic antibody ID problems. My goal today is basically to get you to a point where you're able to handle the vast majority of basic antibody ID problems that people throw you throw at you either on exams or even in real life. I'll try and point out some of the differences between handling these things in real life as opposed to handling them on exams as well. Before we say anything else though, I, I want to be perfectly clear. Um, what you're going to see today is my interpretation of this, uh, of this process. The truth is, is that if you talk to immunohematologists around the world, there are definite variations in how people do things. There's no question about that. You are not going to hear a lot today from me saying this is wrong and don't do it that way. Rather, I'm going to try and point out options and things that some people do, some of which may work well for you, some of which may not. As always, you need to follow your local guidelines. If you're working in a transfusion service, you need to do what's being done in a consistent way with the rest of your service. So anyway, with that little caveat, as I said, we're going to do six cases today. Before you do anything else, please go to the Blood Bank Guy website and print out the handout. Let me show you how to do that. So you go to the main Blood Bank Guy site, which is www.bbguy.org. You do that, and up at the top of the screen, you'll something you see something that looks kind of like this. At least this is the way it looks in April 2012. There may be some changes coming. Uh, if you see in this little bar along the top right, there's a, a, a button for podcast. Click that button. And if you're looking at this sometime near to April 2012, the current podcast will be this one, Antibody ID Basic Cases. Click that. Or if you're not, uh, if, if that's not the current podcast along the right side of the screen, there'll be a podcast archive where podcast seven is antibody ID basic cases. Either way, click that and you'll come to this, uh, this page or a page that looks very similar to this um, that is the, the basic landing page for the podcast. Click that button right there that says download and print the panels and you'll be able to print the handout. It's a fairly decent sized uh, download about uh, a little over two and a half megabytes. So be patient if you if you have a slow connection. You can also, well, you may also be watching uh, this podcast uh, on the in the window that you see below there. Okay, so do that. You got to have it. It really is very, very important to, to have the handouts before we move along. Okay, a couple quick things that I need to mention. Uh, a couple places that I screwed up that several, several of you have been kind enough in a gentle way to point out to me in the basic antibody ID podcast, podcast six, a uh, couple of things that I know about. If there are more, please don't tell me because it's going to drive me out of my mind. But um, <laughs> here's one thing that I did. Um, so it, at, at about 13 minutes, 45 seconds in, I was pointing out uh, in the kid blood group system, the distinction between uh, double dose and single dose uh, corresponding to potentially genetically heterozygous and or homozygous and heterozygous expression of a gene respectively. And when I came to cell five, I was describing this as this showing a double dose of JKB, which obviously means I meant to say that you can assume that genetically this individual is homozygous for JKB, but I actually said heterozygous for JKB. So uh, either way, this qualifies as indeed a fail. So uh, that's number one. The second one is a little bit later, 2357 or so into the podcast. Uh, I was on this slide where I was talking about racial differences between different blood groups and blood group antigen expression. And uh, I read where I down here on the slide where it says Asians are almost all D positive. That is correct. But I actually spoke and said D negative. That'll teach me to speak. Either way, once again, we have a second fail. Um, that's all I know about right now. As I said, if you if you see more, honestly, please do let me know, um, and then I can drive myself crazy before the next lecture. All right. So I mentioned in the in the last 
talk that we that we want to do things in a stepwise manner. I believe that very firmly. This is the process that I use. You can use my process, you can use your own process, but whatever you do, have a process that makes sense to you. As I said, the first thing I always do is check the history. That includes both the patient's history of transfusions as well as what's going on with the clinical history of the patient. Um, I always check the auto control down at the bottom right in general of the panel to make sure that there are no autoantibodies or antibodies against recently transfused antigens. I look at the general pattern of reaction, including seeing if I can figure out what testing platform was was being used uh, to, in order to analyze this antibody panel. Next, I look what, at what's not there. In other words, I do crossouts based on net completely negative cells. We'll show you that in, again in just a second. Then I look at what is there and look and try to match actual presence of antigen with presence of antibody. Uh, special techniques as necessary, um, those potentially include phenotyping, which is done in most cases, but also things like adsorptions and elutions and enzyme treatments, etc. And finally, to ensure statistical significance is very important, especially in the real world, where we're required at a minimum in an immunohematology reference lab to have two examples of where an antigen is present that the antibody reacts and two examples of where the antigen is absent that the antibody doesn't react in order to prove identity of that antibody. Again, you'll see more of this later on and we talked about that extensively the last time. All right, so let's let's just jump right in. This is case number one, our panel number one. I, I hope you have printed uh, your panels already. We're gonna go in great detail through panel number one. I'm gonna give you a chance to work on your own for panels two, three, four, and five, two, three, four, five, and six. But if you want, you are welcome to pause the podcast right now and, and go ahead and go through this yourself and see what you come up with, and then we'll go over it together. So if you wanna do that, fine. If not, we'll continue on in just a second. And let's do that right now. Okay, so when we look at this panel, uh, the first thing I want to do is look up at the up at the top left, where, which is where we have historical information. Uh, you'll see from the clinical history from this particular patient, the patient is pregnant. She's uh, 29 years old, Gravita 4, para, para 3. She's traveling away from home. She's 30 weeks pregnant. That's an important number. Please keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, they're asking for a type and screen because she's been in a minor traffic accident, and we have no previous testing or transfusion history available. On the left side up at the top, uh, you'll see some basic uh, basic testing information. Uh, what have we done already in the, in the laboratory that we can take a look at? Well, the first thing uh, that we'll take a look at is the patient's ABO type. And uh, again, we've talked about this before, but please just keep in mind that if you, if you look at everything to the left of the, the little dumbbell that I just drew there, that is the so-called forward grouping or red cell typing or red cell grouping. Uh, basically, this particular one shows that the individual has an A antigen on her red cell and on the, on the right side of that little dumbbell is the reverse grouping or the serum grouping, which shows that this particular person has an anti-B in her serum. That goes along with the person being group A. Remember, if you, if you, if you look at this, if you look at uh, forward and reverse grouping, the reactions should be opposite of each other. In other words, to the left of the dumbbell, we have positive negative. To the right, we have negative positive. If those are opposite of each other like that, then by definition, you don't have an ABO discrepancy in the vast majority of cases. Okay, so we would interpret that as group A. The individual's anti-D testing shows that she lacks uh, the presence of the D antigen, so we would call her uh, group A negative. No problem there. We look over at the, uh, the antibody screen, which is, uh, this will vary from place to place. You'll see two cell screens, you'll see four cell screens. Probably most common still is the three cell screen, and this is what you see here. And you see a one plus reaction only at the anti-human globulin phase in cells one and two. I should tell you, I'm giving away the panel a little bit, but I should tell you that when an immunohematologist on a three cell panel these reactions in cells one and two, they will almost always think first of an anti-D. And we'll see if that's the case. It, it isn't always anti-D, uh, but it very commonly is. So that's the first thought that will come to an immunohematologist's mind. Okay, so we've worked through that. Um, now let's see what we can learn just from looking at the panel itself. Let's focus our attention on the right side of the screen uh, where I've drawn yellow highlights. And this, this is the results. What can we learn from just looking at these results? Well, first, the first thing that we can learn is that this is tube testing. You have immediate spin phase, 37 degree phase, and, and anti-human globulin phase or AHG phase. By definition, that's tube testing. There's no other platform that has immediate spin. Um, this could be uh, using lists for enhancement. It could be 
using albumin for enhancement. Enhancement, it could just be just with saline. The one thing you know that it's not is enhancement with PEG or polyethylene glycol. Remember, PEG does not have a 37 degree reading uh, by definition in the process. So aside from that, we really can't tell much about it. The next thing that we always do, remember our, our basic process is we check the auto control. Look down at the bottom right there and you'll see that there, the auto control is completely negative. That's great, that's good news. It allows us to interpret the rest of the panel without worrying that there are issues with, the, with that interpretation. Um, the next thing that we want to take a look at is the reactions that we see. So what, what, kind of, what kind of reactions are we seeing along the right side here? Well, we have positives and negatives. Okay, we have some positives and negatives. Every place where it's positive, the reactions are consistent at one plus. The reactions are only in one phase. In other words, the anti-human globulin phase. I think anyone would agree that this is a very uniform pattern, which is typically and far and away most commonly associated with a single IgG alloantibody. And I say IgG because it's only Reacted and reacting at anti-human globulin phase. Okay, so we've learned some stuff from this panel before we got going. Now let's take a look at how we're going to handle this panel. We're down to the step where we look at what's not there. In other words, we're going to take a look at the completely negative reactions, the, the stone cold negative reactions that you see here uh, that are highlighted in yellow, starting with cell five. And we're going to use those cells to actually do rule outs and determine what antigens are not the target of our particular antibody. All right, so this is typically done by sliding a piece of paper up uh, to the first negative cell, which is cell five, and starting to look not just blood group by blood group, but antigen pair by antigen pair to see if there's anything that we can learn. Well, let's start right here with Lewis A and Lewis B. Okay, Lewis A and Lewis B are obviously uh, a pair, and you can see that, that, that this is a double dose expression of Lewis A. We throw out our pencil and do mark a single slash through Lewis A. That makes total sense, right? So double dose expression, you can go ahead and do a rule out. Moving on to big S and little s, okay, please note, this is this is in the MNS system and, <clears throat> excuse me, but we only want to focus on the pair big S and little s. So let's look at that and we see that again, we have double dose expression of big S. Our pencil comes over, we mark a single slash through the big S. Moving on to the next pair, which is M and N. Again, same thing, we wanna keep it with antigenic pairs or uh, pairs that go together in the same genetic site. Again, double dose expression of M, pencil comes over, make a single slash through M. Now I could keep Mr. Hand going all the way across the screen because I love it and it makes me laugh just about every time I see it. But I'll stop now because you're probably getting tired of it. Okay, let's keep moving along the panel. So uh, in the Lutheran system, um, we've got uh, double dose expression of Lutheran B, single slash through Lutheran B. In the P system, there's only one antigen on the panel, that's P1, it's present, there, there's no reaction, we put a slash. Uh, the kid system, uh, we have double dose expression of JKB, so single slash through JKB. Duffy system, uh, double dose expression of, of Duffy B, so we put a single slash through FYB. Then in the Kel system, we've got multiple different pairs here. We've got JSA and JSB, again, double dose expression JSB, single slash. Next, KPA and KPB pair, same thing with KPB, double dose expression, single slash. A big K and little K, double dose expression of little K, single slash, okay? Once we get to the RHHR system, things get a little weird, so, so hang with me here. Uh, we've got several antigens along the end of the RHHR system, and this is typically where they are on a panel, such as V, C, W, and F that don't have any pairs on the, uh, on the panel. So we just look at V individually. Obviously, there's no antigen there, so there's nothing to cross off. Same thing with CW. We move on to F. Um, remember, F is a compound antigen, which is present when you have um, little c and little e on the same chromosome. In other words, when you have a little r haplotype or a big R zero haplotype. Um, and that is obviously the case in cell five. So that antigen is present. You have no reaction. You put a single slash through F. Okay. So very commonly, the big E's and little E's and big C's and little C's are separated the way, the, the way that you see them on this panel right now. So you have to kind of, in your brain, uh, or with your pencil, whatever, uh, look at them as pairs. So here we're looking at little E and big E. You see that we have double dose expression of little E. We put a single slash through little E. Slide over, same sort of argument with big C and little c, except in this case, we have single dose expression of both big C and little c. 
Now there are some, some immunohematologists who will put a, a horizontal slash through both little c and big C in this instance, just to show, hey, we've done a heterozygous or a single dose rule out based on big C and or little c. I personally don't do that. Um, I prefer to keep every, every diagonal slash I put on a panel is a, a double dose rule out. So uh, with one exception, and that we'll show you that in a minute with big K. Uh, so I don't do what I just described to you. So I would not do a rule out for either big C or little c on cell five. And then we move on to, to big D, which is obviously not present and has no reaction. Okay, so we've done the first row. The rest of them will go faster, I promise. We slide down, slide the paper down to cell six. And again, let's go the same way. I've changed the color of the slashes at the top, not because that's anything necessarily important, but just because I want to show you when I'm putting a new slash in. You don't have to break out a 15 colored pen to do these panels. Okay, so uh, uh, cell six, same argument. Lewis A, double dose single slash, um, uh, slide over to big S and little s. Uh, you have single dose expression of both, so n neither one can get a rule out. M and N, you've got double dose expression of Ns, put a single slash. Lutheran B, another double dose, another slash. P1, on, this is the only antigen present, put a slash the other direction. Um, move on to the KID system, we have a double dose JKA, put a single slash through JKA. Uh, in the Duffy system, we have single dose expression of both Duffy A and Duffy B, so no slashes. Uh, JSB, single slash. KPB, single slash. Little K, single slash. You kind of get the picture, and let's move back into RH. Nothing for V, nothing for CW. Single slash for F, little f that is. Um, no slashes for either big E or little e because both have single dose expression. And then finally, a single slash for little c because it's double dose and nothing for big D. Okay, um, one other thing that I wanna tell you before I go any further is that there are, you've seen on this panel or on this row that I in places where I've already had a double dose rule out, and I get another double dose rule out, I'll go ahead and complete the X. In other words, I'll do a diagonal slash the other direction. And that's very common and very commonly done. There are some immunohematologists, however, that once they get one single diagonal slash with a, with a homozygous or double dose rule out, then they won't do additional ones. I personally prefer to do them, but you'll definitely see ones that people that don't. And I'll show you how that looks in, in just a few minutes when we go to case two. Okay, let's let's cruise on um, and uh, look at cell seven. Okay, here we have a double dose rule out for Lewis B, great, single slash. Another double dose rule out for big S, single slash. A double dose rule out for M, single slash. Uh, we've already ruled out Luther and B, nothing more to do. Already ruled out P, nothing more to do. Uh, uh, onto the kid system, and we have JKB, double dose rule out, single slash. We have Duffy B, double dose rule out, single slash. And we've already done JSB, we've already done KPB. Now, this brings us to a, a great topic of discussion right here. We've already ruled out uh, little k, so th there's nothing more to do with that. Uh, th the one exception to that double dose or homozygous rule out thing that I mentioned earlier for me is anti-big K. And most immunohematologists will do this as well. In the setting of cell seven, where you have big K present along with little K, so admittedly that is a single dose of big K and big K, anti-big K can show some dosage. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the vast majority of people will do a single diagonal slash in that setting. And that is really about the only exception. Um, and, and I think that that's an acceptable practice. Okay, uh, back to RH, nothing for V, nothing for CW, already ruled out F, uh, double dose rule out for little E, single slash, double dose rule out for a little C, single slash, and again, nothing for big D. Cruising on, cell eight, um, back to the Lewis system, already ruled out Lewis A, uh, already ruled out big S, uh, single dose expressions, no rule outs, onto Lutheran, already ruled out Lutheran B, already ruled out P. Uh, here's another double dose rule out for JKA, so put another single slash. Um, uh, single dose expression of do both Duffy A and Duffy B, nothing to do. Um, we've, we've already done JSB, already done KPB, already done little k, nothing for V, nothing for CW, already ruled out F. Uh, already ruled out little e, already ruled out little c, and nothing more for big D. 
Okay, cell nine. Um, here's another double dose rule out for Lewis B, put another slash. Uh, we have single doses for both big S and little s, no rule out. Single doses for big M and big M and big N, no rule out. We've already ruled out Luther and B, already ruled out P, already ruled out both of the kids. Um, oh, good. Here we have a a double dose rule out for Duffy A, so we put a single slash through Duffy A, and the rest of this is going to be pretty boring. Uh, nothing to do with with any of the Kells that we haven't already done. Uh, onto RH, nothing for V, C, W, and we've already done F and little E and little C, and again, uh, this is these are RH negative donors, so no D to rule out. Um, 10, which is the last one of the completely negative cells to look at. Let's do that one. Okay, we've already done the Lewis's, nothing to do there. Oh, good. Now here we have a double dose rule out for little s. Let's do that. Um, already ruled out M and N, uh, already ruled out Luther and B, already ruled out P, uh, single dose, no, no rule outs, single dose, no rule outs, uh, on to Kel, and again, nothing for uh, uh, JSB and KPB because we've already ruled them out. Here's another rule out for big K, so put a single slash there. Um, and again, there's nothing new in the RH system that we haven't already seen and have not already ruled out. Okay, I hope you're with me. Um, so you're, at, at the moment, your panel should look very similar to mine. Um, what you wanna do next is go through and circle all the ones that we have not been able to rule out. Um, which, as you see, include big D, big C, big E, CW, V, KPA, JSA, and Lutheran A. Everything else has at least one uh, double dose or homozygous rule out. Okay, I mentioned in the previous podcast that I that I do this a little bit of a different way. I don't do this horizontally. My paper actually slides in a slightly different direction. So if I were confronted with this panel, my paper would come from this side. And let me show you, I won't go through the whole panel again, but let me show you how I do this because people have asked me questions. And I'm also gonna show you using this method uh, and, and only doing one double dose rule out for each antigen before I stop looking at that antigen. Let me explain what I mean. So um, we start with cell five, which obviously is the first completely negative for Lewis A and Lewis B, completely negative cell, I should say. So, so we look at Lewis A and Lewis B in cell five, and obviously, as you see, we have a double dose rule out for Lewis A. We put a single slash there, and we're done. I don't need to look at Lewis A again in the rest of, in the rest of this panel. Um, now, there are there are people that would argue with me on that, and that's okay. If if you want to look more, that's totally fine. From my perspective, uh, I've done a lot of these, and I have not seen a situation where that has led me down the wrong pathway. But blood bankers are very compulsive, and they like to look at everything. So that's totally fine if you want to do that. My advice to you, if you're on an examination in particular don't do more than one double dose rule out because you're wasting your time on an exam. In the real world, maybe live up to a higher standard. Okay, cell six, I, I already, I don't have to do anything with because I already looked at Lewis A. Go down to cell seven. I've got a double dose rule out for Lewis B. Great, bang, put the slash, I'm done. I'm moving on to the next group, which is big S and little s. And I do the same sort of thing here. I, I look at cell five. I have a double dose rule out for big S. Great, I really don't need to do anything else, even though I have another double dose in seven and eight, but I skip all the way down to 10, which is the only place where I have a double dose rule out for little s, I put a slash there, bada bing, bada boom, move on, look at M and N. Again, we're sticking with antigenic pairs, just like we did, everything is the same, that for when we were doing things the horizontal way, it's just that we're doing it vertically and I think we can get through things quicker. Um, okay, again, you, you get the point. M and N, you've got double dose M in five, bang. You've got double dose N in six, bang. We've ruled it out, we're done, we can move along. You go through the panel in a vertical way, just this in the same manner, and you're going to end up with the exact same r set of rule outs that you would have gotten if you do things with a horizontal manner. Again, for me, I find that I get um, I find that I get more benefit. Uh, I, I it happens more quickly for me, I should say, by doing things vertically. Now you, we'll go back to this slide that I showed you before that has multiple cross outs. So uh, please don't let that confuse you. I'm just uh, I'm just showing you different ways to look at this and different ways to go about it. Okay, so the great news is that as we talked about in the last podcast, if you look at CW and V and KPA and JSA and Lutheran A, just about every panel you do, you're not gonna be able to rule those out because those antigens 
are really not present on most panels. Yeah, there's one CW in cell one, but otherwise there's, these antigens aren't even represented. So for the most part, you can just, at least in your brain, you can, you can say, you know what, I'm not gonna focus on them. Those really aren't important to me. So I'm gonna focus on the ones that are, that are high yield in this particular case, big D, big C, and big E. And most of you are already at the point where you know what this, what this panel is, and that's totally fine, but let's just take you through the thought process. So again, the next step is we look at what is there. In other words, let's look at the cells that are reacting and see if we can find one antibody uh, specificity that accounts for all of them. So in this case, let's look at the, at the possibilities. First one is big D. And not surprisingly to most of you, I'm sure, uh, every place big D is present, there's a reaction. Every place big D is absent, there's no reaction. This is a great fit for an anti-big D by itself. But let's look at the other ones. Anti-big C um, doesn't explain all the positive reactions and has one uh, single dose positivity in cell five that is that is non-reactive. So it by itself doesn't explain all the reactions either. Same sort of deal with big E, which is on, which is hardly there at all, um, and doesn't explain all the positives and certainly has one uh, one single dose uh, in cell six that's negative. So our most likely scenario is that this is an anti-big D. And again, in the real world, you've got more work to do. There's no question about that. And let's talk about that in just a second. On an exam, you can make a presumptive identification of this as anti-big D and move along. So let's talk about the other stuff that we would have to do in the real world. Um, the other stuff that we have to do includes potentially phenotyping. In other words, obviously you know what the phenotype of this individual is for D because duh, it's the, person is, the person is group A negative, but you might phenotype for big C and big E to kind of see if there's, if there's uh, what the deal is um, with them as far as the likelihood of them having a different antibody. So you might do that. You probably wouldn't in most cases. You would have to do some selected cells to rule out the other antibodies. In other words, you would wanna do some cells that have varying combinations of big D, big C, and big E. So you can rule out uh, big C and big E. Uh, you would also want to get some further history because this, as I mentioned, the, the 30 weeks pregnant is, is an, important, an important historical fact. Most, uh, most pregnant Rh negative female in the United States at on or about 28 weeks gestation will get a shot of Rh immune globulin. Okay, guess what Rh immune globulin is? It's anti-D. It can give you this exact picture that we're seeing, a fairly weak anti-D um, that, that may not have any clinical significance at all, but without knowing that history, you can suppose it's probably RHIG, but you don't necessarily know. And as part of that workup, that may include doing a titer of anti-D. Certainly if it's real, actual anti-D, you would wanna do a titer and, and help the, the OBs follow the patient. Finally, I just wanna point out to you is that on an exam, it's gonna be really rare for you to get a question that you, you get a panel like this, you go through the panel and the, the, the question is actually saying, what is the antibody? It's really uncommon to do that. Most commonly you'll get second and third generation questions. In this case, for example, you might get a question that would expect you to understand that this patient probably had RHIG and it might, it, it wouldn't ask you, is this anti-D, but it might ask you what additional pieces of information you might wanna get, including RHIG, et cetera, and how would you distinguish an RHIG RHIG, uh, RHIG derived anti-D from an actual anti-D, including things like titers and, and, uh, and the like, and changing of the antibody over time. Anyway, that's, those are topics for another day, but please keep in mind that, that you're not going to see, and please don't expect to see, just straight what is the antibody questions. It doesn't happen very often. Okay, so that was, that was panel one, and I know we spent a lot of time on that. I wanted to take the time to go through it with you. The rest of these will go faster, at least on the podcast. So here is panel number two. Um, and uh, again, hopefully you have this uh, and have it printed out and sitting in front of you. I am gonna, I'm gonna pause the podcast for a moment. Actually, I'm not gonna pause. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop talking for just a second. Please pause the podcast, work on it yourself, uh, see what you can get, and then we'll go through it. So I'll pause for just a moment. Okay, so if you were naughty and, and just kept listening, uh, then, then it's been like a second since I stopped talking and hopefully you've had a chance to look at this 
at this panel. Let's go through it together. So uh, as always, we want to start with a clinical history. We want to take a look at the fact that this is this sample is from a 69-year-old Caucasian male. He's bleeding. He has GI, recurrent GI polyps. He's got a low hematocrit of 19%. He's, he continues to bleed. They want to type in cross. He has no history of antibodies. However, he's been transfused 16 units since 2004, most recently six months ago. Okay, moving on to the uh, to the serologic information, we've got an individual who has no ABO discrepancy, who you would interpret the forward group as A, uh, you would interpret forward and reverse as A, uh, and the RH typing is positive, so this individual, I'm sorry, as O, I said A, didn't I, as O, this individual is O positive. Don't write me about that, okay? I know, I messed up, so I'm we're good. <laughs> and then then we move on and look at the antibody screen, and you again, you see we have, we have reactions uh, at AHG um, only in cell one and cell three. Okay, let's look at the panel itself. Um, again, let's learn, let's glean what we can glean from this situation. Uh, and I've, I've deliberately thrown something at you here that, that you really shouldn't see. If you notice, the, the antibody screen uses immediate spin 37 and AHG phases, while the uh, results only show immediate spin and AHG. This could happen for a variety of reasons. It could be that the, that the laboratory has decided that despite the fact that they're doing 37 degree reads, that it's not that important for the antibody panel. That would be, that would be uncommon, but it, but it certainly could happen. Um, Alternatively, you, you could be seeing a situation where someone's using a different technology for the antibody screen and the antibody panel, which is generally not the greatest idea in the world. Usually when you see just immediate spin and AHG results on a panel, well, you know it's tube testing because there's immediate spin. It might well be PEG because as I mentioned before, uh, when you're using PEG for enhancement, you, you will not have a 37 degree read. Okay, so anyway, uh, what else can we see? The auto control is negative, that's good news, that's what we wanna see. Uh, um, next, let's look at the at the how the reactions look. So we've got some three plus reactions. We've got some one plus reactions. Um, you've got negative cells. So you have what I would call a variable pattern, and I hope you would agree with that. You've got positives, negatives, and you've got variations in the positive, though they're all in the same phase. They're all in AHG. So given that, the most like there are two very likely scenarios that are of pretty close to equal likelihood. First is that of a single IgG alloantibody, which is showing dosage. Dosage we talked about before, that's the double dose versus single dose deal where the antibody reacts stronger within, with a red cell that carries a double dose of the antigen. The other possibility is multiple IgG alloantibodies, which certainly could happen as well. So with that being said, uh, I, I hope that you noticed all that and you went through and you started to look at the negatives and you did your cross outs and you had something that looks like this. So pause this for just a moment, take a look at it and make sure that what you have is similar to what you're seeing up here. Alternatively, as I said, if you wanted to do just the one and done philosophy, uh, in other words, you do one one slash for a double dose rule out and you don't do any more, then your, your cross outs would look like this. And again, e it's fine either way. Um, do it one way or the other, I would recommend, and, and you're probably best being consistent with the rest of the people in your laboratory. But either way, that's how you do it. The way I do it in general leads to the to multiple cross-offs like this. Uh, going beyond two, honestly, some people do that. I'm not sure it adds any value whatsoever. The next step, just as before, is we, we circle the antigens that have not been ruled out as the target of our antibody. Um, again, the good news is, is that most of these you can kind of get rid of in your brain because they're ones that aren't really represented on the panel. Wow, for this one, we're really down to Duffy A and Duffy A alone. Everything else has been, has been ruled out at least once um, or is something that we're kind of ignoring. So now we take a look at Duffy A and we see if that matches our positive reactions. So let's see if it does. We've got three plus reactions in one two, cells one, two, and nine. What do we have for Duffy A in one, two, and nine? Um, oh, I'm sorry, and we also have one plus reactions in six, uh, eight, and 10. So does that match up? Well, for Duffy, for Duffy A in one, two, and nine, we have a double dose expression of Duffy A. That corresponds to the strongest reactions in six, eight and 10, we have a uh, single dose expression of Duffy A that corresponds with the weaker reactions of Duffy A. And that certainly does go along with the fact that this is 
that this appears to be an anti-Duffy A. Now, do you have more work to do? Yeah, you're going to want a phenotype. You're going to want to make sure that this individual is Duffy A negative, and that's the way this would look at the bottom of the at the bottom of the panel. Um, you, you you may have some additional work to do. I mean, if you look over on the, the left side of the panel, you see we only have one homozygous or double dose rule out for big C, anti big C, and anti big E. So you have some additional work there to make sure that, that those are not the target of your antibodies. But fundamentally, this is an anti Duffy A. Again, don't expect, is this Duffy A? Is this anti Duffy A? Expect questions along the lines of racial differences in Duffy A with African Americans being far more common to, to lack Duffy A and Duffy B. Uh, the thought about delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions associated with Duffy A and Duffy antigens being destroyed by enzymes. Things like that are the, are the level of questions that you should expect to see. All right, so that's panel two. Let's move on and do panel three. That went pretty quick, didn't it? Uh, quickly, I should say. Uh, panel three, let's take a look. Um, if you want to pause and, uh, and go ahead and work on this on your own, please do so. I will leave the, uh, the method, my method of how to do this up there and uh, pause it for a minute and let's see how it goes. Okay, welcome back. I took like two breaths. <laughs> and hopefully you've had it again you've had a chance to work on this let's talk about the history uh, t this patient had an autologous stem cell transplant uh, 10 years ago 47 year old female she's been in the hospital for a couple of weeks she has pneumonia um, and doesn't have any previous antibody history but, but has been transfused a lot most recently eight days ago that's kind of a that's kind of a big number there and something that's important for you to, to keep in mind okay and uh, you'll see why in just a second so we've got someone who is typing as group a I got it right that time <laughs> and uh, the R there this person's this lady's RH group is positive so this person is a positive with no ABO discrepancy the DAT which I've thrown in here shows some interesting findings with poly specific reagent we have a one plus MF it doesn't stand for that it stands for mixed field so MF stands for mixed field you have one plus reaction with poly specific two plus a little stronger reaction with IgG and a little bit with C3D that shows that this particular person's sample when pulled from the body is already coated with both IgG and complement and that's an important fact that we'll talk about in just a moment. If you look at the antibody screen, uh, the antibody screen shows only reaction in cell 2. It's a fairly strong reaction in cell 2. More on that in just a second. Uh, I hope that when you took a look at the results you, you thought first, well what's the technology that's being used here? As we talked about in the last podcast, if you see a single column like this, then you are almost always talking about automated technology such as gel or solid phase, in particular if it's unlabeled. Um, it's, for whatever reason, uh, in, people who are using gel and solid phase tend to not label. It's not universal by any means, but it's common to see the results not be labeled. If they are labeled, they would be labeled AHG. So that certainly could be liquid um, in, a, in a, a laboratory that's decided only to read at AHG. HG, and that's totally fine. But more commonly in my experience, that's either a gel or a solid phase lab. Um, if you look down at the bottom, uh, with, with gel, you won't see a positive control or negative control. With solid phase, you generally will see that. So this is probably gel um, that we're seeing here. It's not definite, but it's probably gel. What else can we say? Well, let's look at the autocontrol. Oops, we do have a problem in the autocontrol. And this is not surprising given the, given the DAT results. This, this patient's own serum mixed with his own red cells, her serum mixed with her own red cells, shows a one plus mixed field reaction. The mixed field, and I don't think I defined that, simply means that some of the cells are reacting, some of the cells aren't. You actually have a mixed population of cells uh, classically seen in settings where, the, where a patient has been recently transfused and an antibody is reacting against the transfused cells. So the autocontrol is positive. That will lead us down a couple pathways that we'll talk about in a moment. When we look at the actual reactions, again, we have positives and negatives. This is outside of the autocontrol. Um, we have positives and negatives. We have three pluses. We have one pluses, and we've got some negatives, as I said before. Given this, we have a variable pattern with a positive autocontrol and a mixed field reaction in that auto control the the greatest likelihood by far in this is is that of an antibody against a recently transfused antigen 
Um, so it's a recently developing antibody, basically. It, an autoantibody can happen and give you a positive autocontrol like this, but the mixed field makes that less likely and the clinical history makes that somewhat less likely. Now, in terms of the antibody itself, well, given the pattern that we see outside of the autocontrol, it's the same as the last, as the last uh, one that we looked at in panel two. A single IgG alloantibody showing dosage is, is likely as well as the possibility of multiple L IgG alloantibodies. Either of those could be true. Okay, so with all that being said, now let's take a look at the panel itself and interpret what we see on this panel in light of what we know about the autocontrol. So again, what we're gonna do is go through and do the same sort of cross-offs that we did before. If you did your cross-offs, they should look very similar to this, um, leaving us with, with V, big K, KPA, JSA, JKB, Lutheran A, and M as antibodies that are not ruled out preliminarily. Again, let's take out the ones that, that are low risk for us. And that leaves us primarily with the decision between anti-big K, anti-JKB, and anti-M. You'll notice there are others that have only been ruled out with one double dose expression, but we'll deal with those later. For now, we're gonna try and make a preliminary identification based on this. So let's look at those three antibodies and let's see if any one of them makes sense for all of these positive reactions. Again, let's look at what's there now. Let's look at the positives. All right, let's look first <clears throat> at what we see over on the right in terms of how the reactions look. Again, we have three pluses, we have one pluses, and we have negatives. Um, how does that match up? Well, first let's look at anti-big K. Certainly we can say right from the beginning, by itself, anti-big K does not answer all of these questions. It doesn't answer all of the positive cells. So I, I actually like to start there um, and with that, with that uh, caveat to see if, that, if, if I have one antibody that can explain all of them um, and, and go from there. So I, let's actually move on and let's look now at JKB. JKB actually does explain uh, every single reaction in terms of every place JKB is present, there is a reaction. And in addition, if you'll notice, every place where JKB is only single dosed, you have a weaker reaction. And every place where JKB is double dosed, you have a stronger reaction. I would say that this is actually a perfect fit for anti-JKB. But we need to look at all of them, so let's look at anti-M, and you'll see uh, anti-M is actually explains a lot of these, but doesn't explain cell two. And in addition, the reality is that the vast majority of anti-M antibodies, you really shouldn't see them reacting in gel because they are typically IgM, uh, room temperature reactive antibodies that are generally clinically insignificant. So they, they don't come through, but on occasion they do. I uh, Believe me, I've dealt with enough of these that uh, anyone who's ever worked with gel will tell you, yeah, you definitely see uh, examples of IgM that come through. So um, while I think it's safe to say that anti-JKB is the most, likely, the most likely antibody in this particular example, um, anti-JKB alone, you would definitely have some work to do to rule out the M, rule out the big K. <clears throat> Beg your pardon. Okay, so what, what would we do? Well, one of the things that we would potentially would do is phenotype. If we did the phenotype and we got really lucky and we saw something like this, where, uh, where this individual is positive for big K, positive for M, and negative for JKB, that would certainly argue strongly in favor of it just being an anti-JKB. Of course, it doesn't always work out that way, so it, that may help, it may not help. Phenotyping, though, is an essential part of, of the workups. The select cells are, are primarily where you're going to uh, make a big difference in this case, and you're going uh, you're gonna to do some things like get a cell that's big K positive, JKB negative, and M negative. Make sure there's no reaction with that cell to, to rule out big K. Or a cell that's big K negative, JKB negative, and M positive. Make sure that that's negative to rule out anti-M as a target of your antibody. So uh, you would also need to do some additional rule outs of some of those an antibodies that I mentioned, such as big C, where you only have one uh, homozygous or double dose rule out, Duffy A, Duffy B, big S, things like that. So all those are things that you could do. I don't mention it here. You could also do some work with enzymes, and we'll talk about enzymes on the next panel. Uh, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible for this one. So enzymes would potentially help distinguish between these, in particular between the JKB and the big K antibodies, because JKB antibodies uh, sorry, the JKB antigens are strengthened by incubation with enzymes, so the antibody reaction should be stronger. Finally, you, you can and probably should in this case do an eluate on the patient's own cells. In other words, pull the antibody, which we presume would be an anti-JKB against those recently transfused cells off of 
the surface of those uh, off the, the surface of those the patient's own or sorry the transfused cells uh, that are showing up in the auto control to to I firmly identify this as an anti JKB. Okay, so a lot of work that that you can do, a lot of work that you should do. Again, don't expect the is this anti JKB. They'll talk about delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. They'll talk about how to uh, how to treat delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, how these things happen, etc. So um, be aware of the second generation questions. Okay, we good on that one? I hope so. We're going to move on to cell four, or sorry, panel four, which is a little bit more complicated case. This one comes in two parts. So you have you have the option here. Um, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause for just a moment um, and have you start working on the first part, panel num the one that's labeled panel number four at the bottom. If you want, you can go ahead and go on and do the enzyme one, which is the second part. But I'm going to explain the first part up to the enzymes uh, in just a moment. So stop. Stop the podcast, take a look at this, come right back. Okay, so here's what we have. Uh, we have a, a clinical history of, of a 64-year-old African-American male. He has CLL with multiple transfusions, but now it looks like he's in blast crisis because his hematocrit is low and he has increased blast on the peripheral smear. He was tra he's been transfused a lot. Uh, he's had some nonspecific antibodies, and four months ago, he got his most recent transfusion um, from his history. He's, he has, uh, he is group B, and group B positive. See, I can't allow myself to mess that up from now on. He's group B positive without ABO discrepancy. His antibody screen shows primarily reactivity at the AHG phase in both cells one and three, and a little bit of reactivity at 37 in cell one. Um, more on that in just a second. We go down and we take a look at the panel itself. Okay, again, what can we learn? First, this is tube testing, clearly, no question about that. Um, we have the immediate spin phase, it's clearly two testing. Second, the auto control is negative, that's great, that's the way we like to see it. Uh, third, the, when you look at the reactions, you have, just looking at the AHG phase, you have zeros all the way up to four pluses with everything in between. You have one pluses, two pluses, three pluses, four pluses, um, and obviously zeros, as I said. If you see that variety of, or that much variation, there really is not much doubt that this is a highly variable pattern which is associated with multiple IgG allo antibodies. Now don't let the result in cell 10 uh, at 37 degrees throw you. Sometimes you can get stuff when it's reacting really strongly that, that gives you a reaction at 37 that may not mean a whole heck of a lot. It's there, we'll talk about it later, but it is what it is. Also, please be aware, um, I am using, as you can see, the zero to four plus scale. I'm not using the 12 point scale uh, because I didn't grow up using that and that's that's okay. The, the principles are the same no matter which scale you're using. Okay, sorry, um, let, let's move on from there um, and let's look at what we can do for the rule outs. Here's, here's what you could rule out and you only have three completely negative cells. So not surprisingly, you have a decent number of antibodies that you can't rule out with at least one double dose cross out. But again, if you take away the ones that aren't particularly high risk, and you, you notice on the far right, we have anti-Lewis B, which you can't rule out, but Lewis B, to, to have an anti-Lewis B that does not react at immediate spin or 37 would be shocking. Um, so it's highly unlikely it's an anti-Lewis B. So we're gonna focus our attention on the other three, which is anti-Big C, anti-Big K, and anti-Duffy A, and you see those three right here. Okay, so with those three, uh, we need to we need to take a look at things and see if we can, see what we can do with this panel. Well, this is this is a difficult panel. Obviously, we've got a lot of positive cells and a lot of variation. But let's just start by again, as always, seeing if there's one antibody that can do all this. I don't expect there to be, and neither do you. But let's see. Um, you've got anti Big C, which doesn't explain all the positive reactions, and in fact uh, has cell five where it's a single dose and the and with no reaction. So clearly, there's a little bit of discrepancy there. You have uh, anti-Big K, which clearly doesn't even come close to explaining all the positive reactions. And you have anti-Duffy A, which comes closer than the others, but still doesn't explain all the positive reactions. So clearly we have a situation where we have multiple uh, IgG alloantibodies. So with all that being said, um, 
Oh, and by the way, I did, I did want to point out with cell seven, uh, cell seven doesn't work for this. And in addition, oh yeah, th this is important to note. If you take a look at, at cell 10, you might think that, that the Duffy might explain it by itself, but actually it, that's a really strong reaction and it's a, a single dose of Duffy A, so that four plus doesn't really make sense. So some of the things that you can do, you can, you can do phenotyping certainly, and you probably would do phenotyping to kind of get an idea of, of which ones of these might be the target. That may or may not help. Um, you can and should do, consider the use of select cells, but I wanna take you through how you would use enzymes in a case like this. Um, you should also know that alloadsorption is something you could do. It, for example, you could, you could get a big C positive, big K negative, Duffy A negative cell uh, and adsorb out um, the, an anti-big C um, from, the, from the mixture, do an eluate and identify the anti-big C. So uh, that can certainly be done that's more for the next, uh, the more complex podcast. We're gonna stick with the simple stuff now. Let's actually look at the enzyme panel. So you have the enzyme panel uh, in your packet. So why don't, why don't we stop the podcast for just a second, take a look at the enzyme panel and see what you can figure out based on a quick look at that panel. Okay, so we're back and let's let's see what we can see from looking at this panel. Uh, what I wanna do is I'm actually gonna take on the right side, I'm gonna take these red check marks away, the check cells away. Imagine that they're still there, but I actually want to put in the far right panel, I wanna put uh, the remainder or sorry, the results which were present before enzymes, just so we can use them for comparison. This is not a new test, it's just the, the column that's labeled in red, AHG, that is the previous or the pre-enzyme results just for comparison's sake. Now, very important to recognize, when you do a panel like this, you do not have to go through and look at each and every, do, redo all your rule outs, basically. Stay very focused on what we're trying to do. Remember, here we're really trying to look at anti-big C, anti-big K, and anti-Duffy A. Keep your focus there, and let's see if we can figure out what happens with enzymes with these, and if and if this if this panel makes sense for what we're for what we're proposing? Well, again, just a refresher: uh, what happens with enzymes? Remember the uh, the Rh system enzyme Rh system antigens such as an, such as Big C would be enhanced by the use of proteolytic enzymes because it clears away some of the debris and allows them to be expressed stronger. Um, the Duffy system, or the, which would include FYA antigen that, that we're talking about today, uh, the Duffy system antigens are gonna be greatly decreased or even destroyed, Duffy destroyed, I don't know how you'll remember that, Duffy destroyed, um, by proteolytic enzymes simply because the antigens themselves are cleaved by the proteoly proteolytic enzymes. And finally, Kel, uh, big K antigen as part of the Kel system is completely unaffected by proteolytic enzymes. Enzymes. So you wouldn't expect the reactions to change at all. Okay, that being said, with that kind of a background, so what that would mean is, if this were, if this, if the antibodies present had an anti-big C uh, component, you would expect the reactions to get stronger. If it had an anti-Duffy A component, you would expect the reactions to get weaker. And if it had an anti-big K, you'd expect the reactions to stay the same. So let's look over on the right and let's let's see what actually did happen. Again, we're going to compare the row in red, which is pre-enzyme with the middle row in black of AHG, which is after enzymes, and let's see what we get. All right, so in cell one, we have a decrease. Cell two, we have the same decrease from three plus to zero. That same thing is actually seen uh, down in cell nine as well. Three plus pre-enzyme, zero post-enzyme. So those went down very strongly. Uh, cells six and eight, excuse me, cells six and eight, you had a one plus that went down to zero. Um, and in cell 10, you had a four plus that went down to two plus. Okay, more on that in just a second. If you look at cells seven and 11, you see that they didn't change at all. So we have, basically what we can say right now is that we have some antigenic activity that decreased uh, or some antibody activity that decreased. We presume that the antigenic activity decreased and we have some that stayed exactly the same. So that really tells you that this probably is not anti-big C. Um, and in addition, I'll call your attention to cell five. Um, notice that there's a single dose expression of big C on cell five, uh, which after enzymes did not show up. Commonly, you'll see that kind of a thing where you have a, a dosed anti-big C, for example, that once you do enzymes and that enhances the, act, the activity of the antigen, you actually will see a reaction where there wasn't one before. All those argue in the direction of saying that this is not anti-big C, and in fact that it's more likely a combination of anti-big K and anti-Duffy A.
Okay, so so let's see if we can let's see if we can and pro- see if we can prove that, and that's that's the stuff I was telling you about with the with the reactions not showing up for the big C. Let's see if we can prove that and see if that makes sense based on um, <clears throat> based on what we see in the reactions. Okay, so um, if we look at cells one, two, and nine. We see that those went from three plus pre-enzyme to zero post-enzyme. They were very, you would expect those to be strong with Duffy A because there is a double dose expression of Duffy A in cells one, two, and nine matching that. Duffy is destroyed, so you would ex- that's exactly what you would expect if you had an anti-Duffy A there. All right, the next one let's look at, uh, next two we'll look at is cells six and eight. Those were one pluses, now down to zero. Both of those were single dose Duffy A, now down to nothing. Again, that makes total sense. That's what you would expect to have happen. Next cells seven and 11, both stayed completely the same, did not change at all. Well, perfect fit because both of those have only anti big, or have only big K antigen, um, and you wouldn't expect the big K antibody uh, to show any to show any change in reactivity after proteolytic enzymes. And finally, the one that the one in here that has both is cell 10, which shows uh, both single dose expression of, uh, anti, of FYA and uh, an anti-big K uh, specificity. That went from four plus strength down to two plus. Again, the, the big K stays at two plus and you have additional reaction on pre-enzyme because of the anti-Duffy A that's, that's damaged by the proteolytic enzymes. This makes total sense. It's a perfect fit. So our conclusion is that this is likely an anti-Duffy A and anti-Big K. Well, the one thing you do want to do is you want to go back to your original panel and you want to see, well, does this fit based on what we see in the original panel? And it does. If you look at, if you look at everything that's there, it matches the reactions perfectly and, and you can make a presumptive identification of this antibody as an anti-Duffy uh, A and an anti-Big K. Again, real world, you have more stuff to do. You, you, you've got some phenotyping to do. You've got some additional, uh, some additional rule outs in particular with anti-Big E, anti-Little C, anti-Big S and Little S, et cetera. So real world, you got more work to do, but, but this, is, this is the point of it and this is where we're headed towards. Okay, that one took a little bit longer. I'm sorry, these last two will go fairly quickly. So here's panel number five. Um, again, stop the, stop the podcast for a moment, take a look at this, see what you can work out on your own, and we'll talk about it in just a second. All right, so here, here we have um, a- another prenatal patient. The, this patient is Gravita 1 para 0, so she's just now pregnant. It's her first prenatal workup, first prenatal visit. Uh, she has no previous testing available, no transfusion history. Um, she has, however, uh, an issue when we start looking at her ABO grouping. You notice these reactions are not opposites of each other. You have a positive negative on the forward or red cell grouping, and you have a negative positive on the reverse or the serum grouping. And the one that obviously stands out to you is that little one plus there um, under A1 cells. More on that in just a moment. If you look at the RH grouping, this person is D negative. So in terms of what we would say for this person's ABO and RH type, you would say, "Ah, she's, I don't know, negative. If you, again, if you look at that reaction against A1 cells there, there are a couple things that should immediately jump to mind. The first, obviously, is an anti-1, which would be seen in a group A2 person. It certainly could be that. But in addition, you, you should also be thinking about regular cold autoantibodies reacting against, just non-specifically against the A1 cells, but also a cold alloantibody, meaning an antibody against someone else's red cells that reacts against the those same antigens on the reagent cells. So again, more on that in just a few minutes. Uh, but those are the things you should be keeping in mind. Um, uh, looking at the looking at the antibody screen itself, you see we only have uh, room temperature reactivity at immediate spin for cells one and two. Um, and let's go on and look down at the panel again. You've already done this, I know. So so. Uh, we can say a couple things. It's tube testing. It could be PEG because there's no 37 degree read, but it isn't necessarily PEG enhancement. Could have, it could be LIS, it could be albumin. Um, second, the autocontrol is negative. Great news, we like that. We don't, we don't want to have positive autocontrols. Uh, third, there's a slightly variable pattern when you look at the, the positives and negatives, and you can see these. There's one pluses and two pluses, but nothing more widely spread than that, as well as some negatives. So most commonly, given the fact that these are immediate spin reactions, we would have either a single IgM alloantibody with dosage or a multiple IgM alloantibodies. Let's go through and do the identification and see what we find. Again, looking at the completely negative cells, you do your crossouts and you're going to get um, an interesting pattern. Okay, 
before we talk about that, let me just say this to you. So if you see something like this and you are on an examination, you are absolutely justified with completely immediate spin, room temperature, some would call them cold reactions, to focus on five antigens and five antigens alone as the target of your antibody. Again, only on examinations. I would not recommend you do this in real life. And those five, you see them here. They're Lewis A, Lewis B, M, N, and P. It's almost alphabetical, L, E, L, E, M, N, P. Okay, well, you, you get what I'm saying. So if you want, on an exam, you can focus on just those five. Um, you can do your cross-offs just based on those. And in this case, if you did that, what you would see is that the one that you can't rule out is anti-M. Uh, more on that in just a second. In fact, let's take a look at it real quickly just as a preview. You can see every place there is an M antigen present, there is reaction, and the reactions correspond well with single dose versus double dose. So this is probably an anti-M. Again, this is for the exam world. You can knock out that ID in just a matter of moments. If you are in the real world, honestly, 99.9% .9 of immunohematologists, I think, would say you got to do all the rule outs. You got to do all the cross outs and go through and, and, and do all these things and, and see what you have and see what you don't have. Um, and again, it's it's pretty it's pretty clear in this case that this is an anti M. So I, I'm I'm not going to take you through each and every one. You would handle this in exactly the same way you handled some of the other cases, uh, in terms of seeing what the best fit is. If necessary, doing well, you probably would do phenotyping. If necessary, doing select cells, etc. But my point here was to show that this is an anti M, which brings us back to the ABO discrepancy. Um, in this particular case, it is most likely that the reaction that we're seeing with A1 cells is due to this anti-M, a cold IgM alloantibody or room temperature IgM alloantibody that is reacting against the reagent cells that are M positive. So you would get around that by testing some cells using reagent cells that were M negative, for example. So uh, several different ways that you can get around that, but most importantly, uh, recognize that, that that is a consequence and a, and a recognizable and understandable consequence of, of having a room temperature IgM alloantibody. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Uh, let's cruise on and do panel number six. And this is the last one for today. Um, I hope you guys are hanging with me and I hope this is beneficial. Um, again, I'm gonna pause, the, pause things for just a moment. Um, you have to physically hit the pause button and then we'll start talking again. Okay, I hope I made sense there. Physically hit the pause button. I hope you hit the play button again. Otherwise you wouldn't be hearing me and I'm being silly. Okay, um, I'm a little punch drunk at this point, so. Clinical history, uh, uh, older gentleman, Caucasian male, uh, left total hip arthroplasty three years ago. He's now having the other side done. They want to type and cross. Um, he, was, he got six units of red cells after his last hip, um, and he has had none since, and that was three years ago. Um, looking, at his, looking at his testing, he is group O. He is group O positive. There are no ABO discrepancies, no issues to speak of there. And when we look at the panel, we see again, uh, sorry, the screen, we see that we have reactions in cell one and cell two. Um, again, remember, I'll, uh, immunohematologists and blood bankers around the world, when they see positive reactions in one and two, usually think anti-D. In this particular case, that may not be the right answer. Let's go down to the panel and let's look at again and see what we can learn. We can learn that this is probably gel or solid phase testing because it's unlabeled. Uh, it's probably gel because there are there are no um, positive and negative controls at the bottom as you would see with solid phase. But again, this could just be an unlabeled AHG uh, from tube testing. That is less common though, as I said before. Okay, what else do we see? The auto control is negative. That's important. We like that. Um, next, we see that we have a, again a highly variable pattern. Take a look at the at the reactions on the right highlighted in yellow and you'll see zeros in the first four but you've got one, two, three, and four pluses across the board. Again, given this fact that we have a highly variable pattern, this is almost certainly multiple IgG alloantibodies. Okay, do our cross-offs, same as before, and what do we get? Well, we get um, uh, a multitude, actually a surprising number of, of antibodies that can be ruled out at least once with a single, uh, sorry, with a double dose, uh, single slash, and in some cases, more than one. So what do we have? Well, we have these here, V, big K, KPA, JSA, Lutheran A, big S, and Lewis A. Um, and again, we take out the lower priority ones and we're left with anti-big K, anti-big S, and anti-Lewis A as our main possibilities. 
Well, uh, let's look at what's there and let's try and figure out which of these makes sense. And again, let's see if one antibody can explain all of these reactions. We don't expect it to, but let's see. Anti-big K doesn't work by itself. Um, for obvious reasons. Anti-big S doesn't work by itself for obvious reasons, and anti-Lewis A doesn't work by itself for obvious reasons, and honestly, it would be uncommon for anti-Lewis A to be reacting um, in, in gel or solid phase at this point, but it's possible. So obviously we don't have any match, so we could do some stuff. We could go down different pathways with, with enzymes, for example, um, though they may, not be as, uh, they may not be as beneficial because they're not hugely effective on big S, uh, and they're not effective at all on, on big K, but l let's not go that pathway. Let's go the pathway of trying to figure out just from the pattern uh, what we have and see, see what we can do with that. So let's take a look. Okay, let's start by supposing what if this is a combination of anti-big S and anti-Lewis A. Let's just go cell by cell and see if these make sense. Okay, so we have double dose of both big S and Lewis A in cell five, that might work um, with a three plus. You have a single dose of big S and a double dose of Lewis A in six with a one plus. Okay, yeah, maybe. Um, cell seven doesn't make a lot of sense because um, you've got a four plus, yeah, it's double dose for big S, but, it, but it's nothing for Lewis A and it's actually stronger than five where you had a double dose Lewis A. So that one's not real logical. Cell eight is just like cell five. Some of that may or may not work. Um, you have a, a single dose big S in nine with nothing for Lewis A. So a one plus, okay, maybe. Um, a two plus in cell 10, yeah, okay. But uh, cell 11 is the problem for this combination where you have nothing for either big S or Lewis A and you have a, a two plus reaction. So uh, by themselves, anti-big S and anti-Lewis A don't really work. So let's, let's try something else. Let's try the com combination of anti-big K and anti-Lewis A. Well, you can see right from the beginning with cell five and cell six that that's not gonna work because the only things present in five and six are a double dose of Lewis A and you've got a three plus versus a one plus and that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So cruising down uh, to cell four, or sorry, so cell seven, which has a big K and has a four plus, maybe. Um, again, you've got another three plus with only Lewis A and eight, that doesn't make sense. You've got neither in cell nine with a one plus reaction, that doesn't make sense. And again, 10 and 11, do, just don't work because they're, they should be stronger in 10 uh, if they are truly both there. So that combination doesn't work well. So let's try our other combination, which is the combination of anti-big K and anti-big S. Well, you're, you're probably guessing that this one is gonna work, and it does. Uh, so double dose of big S in cell five with a three plus, single dose in cell six with a one plus, uh, both big K and uh, big S in cell seven, that gives you a, a, a strong four plus. Only uh, cell, cell eight is basically the same as cell five in terms of the antigens that are present. Cell nine uh, is the same as cell six. Um, and finally, cells 10 and 11 are sitting down there by themselves with only anti-big K or only big K antigen present and they're giving you the kind of reactions that you would expect. So you would presumptively uh, make the diagnosis or make the call that this is most likely the combination of anti-big S and anti-big K. But obviously in the real world, your work is not done. We've got some more stuff to do and that stuff that we have to do will include some things like phenotyping, absolutely using select cells as necessary, again with pot varying combinations of positives and negatives and doing additional rule outs on some of those that only have one rule out like anti-big E, uh, anti-JKB, things like that. So more work to do, but we at least have a preliminary evaluation and we have a pr presumptive diagnosis of what's going on here. Okay, so we've talked for a long time. I really hope that this was useful for you. I, I've, uh, this took a lot longer than I had anticipated because you can imagine each little slash and each little thing that's on there had to be done uh, pretty much by hand and my crack staff of one, which is me, uh, was, <laughs> was doing it. So I apologize for the delay. I hope it's useful. Please send me some feedback. I want to thank the people that are listed on here. Um, in addition, the one person that I, I I just am noticing that I didn't list, and I can't believe I didn't list, is, is Kevin Elman, who's a medical technologist from North Colorado Medical Center. Kevin, shout out to you. Sorry, buddy. Um, f f the folks at, North, at uh, Bonfi's Blood Center, thank you for your help. For my original inspiration, my mentors back at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, uh, the, the wonderful and talented Connie Howard, and the amazing Linda Gary. So thanks, everybody, for this. For questions, go to the Blood Bank Guy website. Um, so glad to have you here. 
please note the the uh, the caveats on the next slide um, and and enjoy the use of this use it in whatever way works best for you as long as you don't change it and as long as you don't charge anybody for it I'm fine with that so thanks very much and have a great day